How's it going folks? Welcome to my third discussion video. If you like this video, be sure to leave a like afterwards and share it, as well as give me your feedback in the comments. Now let's get into it. Terrorism, oppression, loss, and war. The nation of Afghanistan is infamous for many reasons in the minds of many Americans today. After the United States of America was attacked on 9-11, the nation found itself grieving and furious. Although there were warning signs before the attacks, Terrorists had managed to hijack four planes and managed to crash three of them into buildings, including the World Trade Center, which collapsed that day, killing thousands. After determining that the masterminds behind the attacks were the terrorist group Al-Qaeda, President George W. Bush issued an ultimatum to the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. During this time in 2001, Afghanistan was led by the Taliban, who were another separate terrorist group allied with Al-Qaeda and giving them sanctuary in their country to plot further attacks against the United States. After Bush's ultimatum was refused and the U.S. Congress authorized military action against the terrorists, the United States of America, along with its allies in the Commonwealth, launched Operation Enduring Freedom on October 7, 2001, invading the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan and beginning a 20-year-long war between the United States and the Taliban. But how did Afghanistan get to this point? It is a long and tragic tale. Popularly referred to as the Graveyard of Empires, the nation of Afghanistan has a long and rich history. Home to a diverse group of people, mainly the Indo-European Pashtun people and various Turkic minorities, Afghanistan has had various empires come and go across their lands through the ages, including the Persians, the Greeks, the Indians, the Arabs, the Mongols, the British, the Soviet Union, and the United States of America. After countless wars and occupations through the centuries, Afghanistan was reunified under a native government led by Amir Dost Mohammad Khan as the Emirate of Afghanistan. However, Amir Dost Mohammad Khan died mere days after completing the reunification of his land, and soon, his work began to come undone. During this era of turmoil, Britain launched three invasions of Afghanistan, significantly weakening the emirate. After fending off the last of these three British incursions, the emirate of Afghanistan was transformed into the Kingdom of Afghanistan, a sovereign Afghan-led state in 1926. After a civil war over who would be the king, Mohammad Nadir Shah, a descendant of the legendary Amir Dost Mohammad Khan, emerged as the ruler of Afghanistan. King Mohammad Nadir Shah helped to modernize Afghanistan's roads, improve Afghanistan's military, and during his reign, Afghanistan saw its first university open. However, the king's rule was cut short when he was assassinated in 1933 by a member of the persecuted Hazara minority. After the death of King Mohammad Nadir Shah, he was succeeded by his son, Muhammad Zahir Shah, who henceforth shall be referred to simply as King Muhammad for the sake of brevity. King Muhammad would go on to be the longest serving leader of modern Afghanistan, enacting a variety of successful policies and reforms. His achievements included expanding Afghanistan's diplomatic relations across the world, including capitalist and communist countries, modernizing the country, creating a constitutional monarchy, and providing Afghanistan stability as a non-partisan head of state. During his reign, he never executed a single political opponent and introduced free elections, expanded civil and political rights, women's rights, and introduced universal suffrage for the people of Afghanistan. For the 40 years of his reign, the king presided over a peaceful, prosperous, and stable Afghanistan. Little did King Muhammad know, however, that he would in fact be the last king of Afghanistan. While King Muhammad was abroad in Italy for medical treatment in 1973, his cousin, Prince Muhammad Daoud Khan staged a military coup against the king, overthrowing the kingdom of Afghanistan. Daoud Khan was jealous of the king and believed that he lacked leadership skills and the adequate ruthlessness to rule, and that the slow-churning democratic process prevented the radical change Daoud Khan sought. After the king was overthrown, he went into exile and was prohibited from returning to Afghanistan. However, during the king's exile, he was approached by the Soviet Union, India, and the United States, who all voiced that they wished to see the king return and play a part in leading Afghanistan in some capacity. Meanwhile, Dawood Khan assumed control of Afghanistan as its dictator, and would rule the country for the next five years. However, Dawood Khan went on to alienate everyone in Afghanistan during his rule. He alienated the far left with a purge of communists across the country, the right wing and far right traditionalists with his radical policies, and the center left with his one party dictatorial rule all while increasing tensions with neighboring countries and cracking down on dissent and civil liberties. Finally, Daoud Khan's list of enemies grew too long for the dictator's rule to continue, and in 1978, the communists of Afghanistan, backed by the Afghan military and the Soviet Union, staged another coup against Daoud Khan, 
murdered him and most of his family, and overthrew his failed dictatorship, establishing a communist dictatorship in its place. With Afghanistan now an unstable communist dictatorship, the new regime enforced socialism and de-Islamization in the deeply religious country. This, in turn, created a massive backlash against the communist regime. Following this, in 1979, the people of Afghanistan, outraged by the actions of the communist government, began to violently resist the regime. This plunged the entire nation into civil war. The communist government of Afghanistan quickly began to falter and internally destabilize as a result of internal power struggles. To stop the government from collapsing, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan to prop up the moribund government in 1979. On the opposite side, the Afghan people formed anti-communist Islamist rebel groups called Mujahideen, who were backed by the Islamic world and the United States, and fought against the communist invasion of their country. After years of bloodshed and violence, the Soviet Union withdrew from the country in 1989. Three years later, the communist regime collapsed. What should have been a victory for the Afghan people, however, quickly devolved into further violence, as the Mujahideen were only united against communism. Once the communist threat was gone, religious and ethnic differences were the new dividing line. Throughout the 1990s, the various factions of the former Mujahideen fought for control of Afghanistan, reducing the already battered country to rubble and causing countless deaths. Finally, after what seemed to be endless bloodshed, the chaos of the civil war came to an end as all but two factions were defeated or assimilated. The Taliban, an Islamic fundamentalist group once a faction of the Mujahideen, were now the most powerful group in Afghanistan. The only other remaining faction was the Northern Alliance, a ragtag group of anti-Taliban fighters, many from the former Mujahideen, who, as their name suggested, were concentrated in the northern Panjshir Valley of Afghanistan. Soon, a charismatic military commander named Ahmad Shah Massoud, nicknamed the Lion of Panjshir, became the leader of the Northern Alliance. Massoud was a veteran of the Soviet invasion and the Civil War, and also a devout Muslim, who rejected the Taliban's extreme fundamentalist interpretation of Islam, instead promoting ideas of democracy, human rights, and equality. Soon enough, Massoud's differences with the Taliban would bring him into conflict with them, and Massoud would go on to wage an effective insurgency against the Taliban during the late 1990s. Soon reaching the status of national hero and legend, Massoud was one of the most effective guerrilla leaders of the modern era and spent the years leading up to 2001 advocating internationally for the Afghan people suffering under the Taliban rule, whilst also fighting a war against them. Furthermore, Massoud warned the world that the terrorists of Afghanistan were planning a massive terror attack in early 2001, but was ignored. Tragically, on September 9, 2001, Ahmad Shah Massoud, hero of Afghanistan, was murdered by the Taliban's ally, Al-Qaeda, in a bomb attack ordered by international terrorist Osama bin Laden. Two days later, Osama bin Laden would also order the 9-11 attacks against the United States of America and cause the American invasion of Afghanistan. After the United States invaded and took control of Afghanistan, they immediately set about establishing a new government. Now an elderly man of 87 in the twilight of his life, King Mohammed finally returned to his homeland in 2002 and immediately began to help efforts to construct a new government for the people amidst hopes the old king would retake the throne and rule Afghanistan one last time. However, due to concerns regarding the king's view on a border dispute with Pakistan, the United States pressured King Mohammed to renounce his right to lead the nation. In 2002, the king opened the Loya Jirga, which is an assembly where powerful local leaders make decisions and hold elections in traditional Afghan culture. The Loya Jirga selected the U.S.-backed Hamid Karzai to lead a new Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. King Mohammed was given an honorary title and retired to his old palace, living out the last years of his life back home. King Mohammed, the last king of the Afghans, passed away on July 23, 2007. He was 92 years old. In the face of the American invasion and U.S.-backed government being established, the Taliban regrouped as an insurgency and began terrorist attacks across Afghanistan. The U.S. dug in to fight the insurgency, and instead of leaving quickly as they had planned, they became bogged down in a guerrilla war, as the government of Afghanistan, corrupt and ineffective, was unable to hold off the Taliban by themselves. The situation was worsened when U.S. President George W. Bush invaded Iraq in 2003, stretching the United States military thin as the U.S. began to fight two wars at once. After years of losing ground and casualties, in 2021, the United States withdrew from Afghanistan following a 2020 peace deal with the Taliban. As the withdrawal ramped up, the Taliban seized on the opportunity. Utilizing their own momentum in tandem with the exhaustion and corruption of the Afghan Republic, the Taliban swiftly retook all of Afghanistan in August 2021, with its capital Kabul falling on August 15th of that year. With the Taliban in full control, the Republican government fled. 
women's rights were curtailed, civil liberties were curtailed, and even areas that had once resisted the Taliban fell before them. The nation was tired of war, and the strain of four decades of violence simply took its toll on the nation. With the Taliban back in charge, the future for many Afghans is unclear and bleak. I'll admit, this is not a happy story in the slightest. We all saw the images coming out of Kabul that August, the fear on people's faces, the uncertainty. But there is one thing to take solace in. This is a what if. What if things had simply gone another way? What if, in 2001, the United States of America had made the decision to reinstate King Mohammed and the Kingdom of Afghanistan returned? Let's find out. Our point of divergence for this story will be far removed from Afghanistan, at least for now. But don't worry, it all connects. On November 21st, 1999, five-year-old Elian Gonzalez was discovered off the coast of Florida. The young boy had been taken by his mother and stepfather in a raft from Cuba to live in the United States. However, the boat had a faulty engine, took on water, and went under. Little Elian was put on an inner tube and set adrift. When Elian Gonzalez was found and taken to the United States, immediately a controversy began. His great-uncle Lazaro and Aunt Marislesis Gonzalez, both paternal relatives who were Cuban-American, became his temporary guardians and insisted that Elian remain in the United States. However, his father in Cuba demanded his son be returned to him. The controversy began to heat up in early 2000 and quickly became embroiled within that year's contentious presidential race. Republican frontrunner George W. Bush firmly supported that Gonzalez be kept in the United States and not returned to Cuba. Democratic frontrunner Al Gore initially supported keeping Gonzalez in the United States and not returning him to Cuba, but then flip-flopped on the issue, later struggling to establish a coherent opinion on the matter at all. With this, we make one change. Al Gore, throughout the entire Elian Gonzalez controversy, maintains that the boy not be returned to Cuba and stay with his Cuban-American relatives. This isn't to say this affects the outcome of the controversy, nor is it a critique of the morality of the situation in general. Simply put, Al Gore's strong stance against repatriation is remembered by the Cuban-American community, and this endears him to them. Unlike in our timeline where Gore's flip-flopping makes him hated and infamous within the Cuban-American community, at least in Florida. In our timeline, election night 2000 was chaotic, with Florida being too close to call, countless legal issues regarding a recount, and the result being delayed for weeks. Eventually, a recount effort to clarify who had won Florida was shut down by the U.S. Supreme Court, and because George W. Bush was in the lead before the recount, he was declared the winner and became president. However, thanks to Gore's strong stance on the Gonzalez controversy, in this alternate timeline he gains enough votes just to barely eke out a solid victory in Florida on election night 2000. On January 20th, 2001, Al Gore is sworn in as the 43rd president of the United States of America. For the first seven months of his presidency, it is business as usual, as President Gore works on accomplishing his policy goals. In April 2001, just as in our timeline, legendary anti-Taliban Afghan freedom fighter Ahmad Shah Massoud, in a speech before the European Parliament in Brussels, Belgium, warns the world that his intelligence agents have uncovered evidence of an imminent, large-scale terrorist attack on the United States of America. And finally, we arrive to the most important day in 2001. In this timeline, it is not September 11th, but August 6th. On this date, the notoriously meticulous President Gore receives his daily presidential briefing titled, Bin Laden Determined to Strike U.S. Unlike President Bush, who ignored this briefing, President Gore pours over it. Remembering past information he'd learned, including a 1998 report regarding possible Al-Qaeda plans to hijack aircraft, President Gore becomes concerned and resolute to stop any potential terrorist attacks. He then remembers a speech he'd seen a few months back of Ahmad Shah Massoud warning of an impending terrorist attack on U.S. soil. On August 7, 2001, President Gore orders the State Department to make contact with Ahmad Shah Massoud and arrange a meeting. During a phone call, Gore asks for Massoud's help in thwarting any upcoming terrorist attacks. Massoud agrees in exchange for increased food aid to the Northern Alliance in Gore's next budget proposal and Gore advocating for more aid for Afghanistan in the world stage, to which Gore agrees. The date is set. Ahmad Shah Massoud will fly to Paris to meet with agents of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency on September 8, 2001. Meanwhile, President Gore gets into contact with the private companies that run airport screening and implores them to increase their security measures due to the dangerous situation currently unfolding. However, Gore also ensures to keep the whole matter as quiet as possible to avoid mass hysteria. On September 8, 2001, Ahmad Shah Massoud's would-be Al-Qaeda assassins end up failing to secure an audience with him as he left Afghanistan for Paris days ago. The failed assassins attempt to alert their superiors, but the whole Al-Qaeda network is focused on something big. And just like that, Ahmad Shah Massoud, the Lion of Panjshir, 
has unknowingly escaped death. Ahmad Shah Massoud's meetings with the CIA go well, and President Gore obtains as accurate a picture of the plot as possible. He ensures that the private security companies will be made aware of an impending terrorist attack via aircraft on U.S. soil, and implores them to increase the thoroughness of baggage searches at least for the rest of the year. The morning of September 11th, 2001, begins as any other day in America. However, for the people of the East Coast, the day will be anything but normal. At 6.45 in the morning, Al-Qaeda operatives led by Mohammed Atta arrive at Boston's Logan International Airport, intent on hijacking flights 175 and 11 and crashing them into the Twin Towers. However, because of President Gore's quiet tip-off to the private security companies, Atta and his fellow operatives have their luggage searched thoroughly. The airport security finds knives and mace in their luggage. Similarly, Atta's accomplices at Newark International Airport and Washington Dulles International Airport are searched and found to have mace and utility knives. The 19 men are taken into custody, and upon running background checks, federal agents determined that the 19 men were Al-Qaeda agents intent on committing suicide attacks against as-of-yet unknown buildings within the eastern United States. The men are held indefinitely pending an investigation, and years from now, Many will speculate what that day in September may have looked like if they'd managed to slip past security. That night, President Gore addresses the nation, informing the American people of how the government had stopped what had the potential to be the deadliest terror attack in American history. After celebrating this fact, President Gore becomes solemn. My fellow Americans, although we escaped a terrible fate today, this terrorist group, Al-Qaeda, was not defeated. Al-Qaeda and those who harbored them present a clear and present danger to the well-being and security of the United States and the American people. Let it be known that we make no distinction between those who plan these acts and those who harbor them. We will stop the men who plan these attacks and bring them to justice. You have my word. God bless you all, and God bless America. Three days later, just as in our timeline, the United States Congress passes the joint resolution to authorize the use of United States armed forces against those responsible for the recent plot launched against the United States enabling the United States to exercise military force against Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. However, unlike in our timeline, where President Bush gave a speech to Congress on September 20th, President Gore simply addresses the nation from the Oval Office, because overall, the situation in late September 2001 in this timeline is worlds apart from our own. After all, the plot was foiled, and while there is shock and anger, there is no sadness, just gratitude. Likewise, there is no outpouring of international support worldwide, just another headline that the United States foiled a plot. Still though, our closest allies, mainly Britain, agree to aid us in hunting down the perpetrators. While the United States successfully argues their case before the UN and justifies any future military action against Al-Qaeda, NATO Article 5 is never triggered, and whatever military action the United States undertakes will be done alone, albeit with international goodwill. During his September 20th address, President Gore reveals to the world that the Al-Qaeda masterminds behind the plot are in Afghanistan and gives the Emirate of Afghanistan an ultimatum to hand over bin Laden and his associates. Just as in our timeline, Afghanistan's leader, Mullah Omar, refuses, stating that since the plot was foiled, there is no justification for any United States intervention in his country, and denies that Osama bin Laden was connected to the plot. Following this, President Gore gets into contact with resistance leader Ahmad Shah Massoud, during their discussions by telephone, President Gore relays to Massoud an old CIA contingency plan for toppling the Taliban alongside the Northern Alliance. Then the two men come to an agreement to fight the Taliban together. Massoud begins planning the invasion alongside his U.S. military counterparts. By late September 2001, CIA teams are in Massoud's Panjshir Valley stronghold, finalizing their plans. Meanwhile, President Al Gore prepares for the political ramifications of the coming conflict and begins research into the political history of Afghanistan because, the meticulous man he is, he wishes to attain the best outcome possible. After realizing that Afghanistan had once had a king under which they'd prospered with him as a symbol of stability, Gore begins to hypothesize a possible restoration as the old king still yet lives in exile. When President Gore contacts King Muhammad on October 1, 2001, the king and him enjoy a lively conversation, with the king expressing his relief that the 9-11 plot was foiled. At the end of the call, President Gore tells the king how much he admired him and the peace and stability he'd once brought to his homeland. He then asks the king if he would rule again to provide that same peace and stability to his people now, who were suffering under Taliban rule. The king begins to get emotional on the phone, then resolutely states that he will help his people in any way he can, including reclaiming the throne. 
President Gore ends the phone call confident of Afghanistan's future, then immediately contacts the State Department, asking to be put through to Ahmad Shah Massoud in the Panjshir Valley. On October 4th, 2001, the British release a report detailing definitive evidence linking Osama bin Laden to the 9-11 plot. On October 7, 2001, with radio silence from the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, President Al Gore authorizes the commencement of a U.S. aerial bombing campaign in Afghanistan, saying, The Taliban have ignored us and the seriousness of this matter, and they will be dealt with accordingly. Time has run out for these terrorists. Democracy will return to Afghanistan. The invasion is swift and resolute. American airstrikes weaken the Taliban's power significantly and decimate their forces, while the U.S. military achieves a swift victory across the land of Afghanistan in the opening days of the war. Meanwhile, Ahmad Shah Massoud rallies his men in the Panjshir Valley. Comrades, these past few decades we have fought tyranny in the name of freedom and communism in the name of Islam, and now we find ourselves facing our greatest triumph yet. The Taliban have foolishly provoked the Americans, and soon they will fall, and when they do, we shall be the inheritors of a powerful and free Afghan state. I have even better news. When the Taliban are gone, our dear king, Mohammad Zahir Shah, will return to rule us once more. Today, we take the first step in building a bright future for Afghanistan. With that, the Northern Alliance launches a massive attack from the north against the Taliban. With Ahmad Shah Massoud's wise leadership, they are even more effective than they were in our timeline. On November 5, 2001, the Taliban lose effective control over the entire country and flee to the mountains, fearing reprisals from the oppressed populace. The capital of Afghanistan, Kabul, falls the same day to coalition forces. As the U.S. Army and Northern Alliance arrive in the city, they are greeted by a grateful and jubilant populace. A famous photo is taken of Ahmad Shah Massoud and General Tommy Franks, the U.S. general in charge of the invasion, smiling and shaking hands in front of Kabul's main palace, the ARG, the photo is entitled, Democracy Comes to Afghanistan. After ensuring a wholly stable security situation, which is easier with Ahmad Shah Massoud's leadership in this timeline, on December 1st, 2001, King Mohammad Zahir Shah and his wife, Queen Humaira, arrive from exile in Italy to a raucous and overjoyed crowd in Kabul. The elderly king, after waving to his old subjects, is whisked off to the Arg, where General Franks and Ahmad Shah Massoud await. After introductions, the three men get to work on their plans for restoring King Mohammed to the throne. That night, in a proclamation to the nation of Afghanistan, King Mohammed announces that he will ascend to the throne once more and proclaims the rebirth of the Kingdom of Afghanistan. To my fellow Afghans, I, King Mohammed Zahir Shah, am happy to announce to you on this day that I have returned to my homeland and to my palace in Kabul. Now that the Taliban threat has been neutralized, a day I thought I would never see in my lifetime has arrived. Because of the actions of our national hero, Ahmad Shah Massoud, I am able to retake my throne and guide all of you, my children, once more. I am old now and do not know for how long my reign will last, but know that I and General Massoud will be working tirelessly to ensure a better future for all of you. I am grateful though on this night. I know that if we work together as one, our kingdom will return to its former glory. Thank you. A few days later, King Muhammad announces that he will wait for a loyal jirga to be held before he is formally coronated and has his rule legitimized by tribal elders. In cooperation with UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, Massoud and Franks arranged for a loya jirga to be held in summer 2002. Furthermore, King Mohammed reassures Pakistan that he will accept the Duran Line border and not dispute it with them. Until then, the king works with Massoud to create a new government made up of surviving royalist officials from before the 1973 coup and Northern Alliance leaders. Ahmad Shah Massoud, to the joy of all of Afghanistan, is appointed interim prime minister by King Mohammed and he and the wisest political leaders of the Northern Alliance immediately begin to steer Afghanistan from the brink of chaos in the aftermath of the invasion, backed by the United States who supplies them with military and economic aid. As the King and Prime Minister Massoud work to build a new Afghanistan based on trust, faith, peace, and democracy, the Taliban are left without an answer to this. Fleeing to the eastern Afghan Tora Bora cave complex alongside their Al-Qaeda allies, the Taliban face their darkest hour on December 6, 2001, as Prime Minister Massoud and General Franks make a final push to crush Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. As Massoud mobilizes his forces for the strike on Tora Bora, backed by General Franks, the joint terrorist forces are caught unable to escape, and during this battle, Osama bin Laden, who in our timeline was in the battle early on but escaped due to a lack of significant troop presence on the ground, is killed by soldiers of the Northern Alliance, and his corpse is handed over to the United States military. After identifying that the body is indeed Osama bin Laden, President Al Gore addresses the nation on December 8, 2001. Good evening. 
my fellow Americans. Tonight I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States of America and Kingdom of Afghanistan have conducted an operation that has killed Osama bin Laden. Our objectives in Afghanistan are nearly complete. We have crippled Al-Qaeda and their Taliban allies' ability to terrorize innocent people around the world. On June 11, 2002, King Mohammed opens the Emergency 2002 Loya Jirga, chaired by Prime Minister Massoud. With 2,000 delegates attending and monarchist fervor at the highest it had been in Afghanistan since the 1973 coup, the delegates easily coronate and certify King Mohammed as the King of Afghanistan, with King Mohammed winning 94% of the vote by the Loya Jirga. The government of the Kingdom of Afghanistan and the authority of King Mohammed and Prime Minister Massoud is now recognized by all the major tribal leaders of Afghanistan. The delegates of the Loya Jirga pledge their loyalty to the king and his authority. Following this, on July 1, 2002, the king's son, Crown Prince Ahmad Shah Khan, returns to Afghanistan, ready to succeed his elderly father after his death. After nearly a year and a half of occupation, the United States of America, confident that the king and prime minister have secured Afghanistan, withdraws from the country on March 20, 2003. To see the last U.S. troops off, President Al Gore pays a special visit to Kabul, where he meets King Mohammed and Prime Minister Massoud, who are busy arranging for free and fair elections to be held in October 2004. After seeing the last U.S. military transport off from Mohammed Zahir Shah International Airport, President Gore is invited to a banquet held by the King and the leaders of the Northern Alliance. Together, the President, the King, and the Lion of Panjshir celebrate having made the world safe for democracy and defeating the terrorist threat. As the years pass, the September 11th plot, the restoration of the Afghan Kingdom, and Al-Qaeda quickly fade from America's memory. Instead of being a traumatic 20-year ordeal, the war in Afghanistan, in this timeline simply called the Afghan Restoration in the U.S., is often compared to the Gulf War, or Spanish-American War, because of its brevity and success. Meanwhile, in 2004, Ahmad Shah Massoud successfully holds a free and fair election in Afghanistan, with his political party, the Jamiat-e-Islami, or Islamic Society Party, winning a strong majority in the unicameral Afghan parliament. Meanwhile, the king, increasingly frail, largely retires from public life, mainly appearing at important ceremonies and giving addresses to the nation on Islamic holidays. By 2009, the Taliban, fragmented, weakened, and lacking any sizable support in the face of Ahmad Shah Massoud's political revolution, disbands and reintegrates into Afghan society, with many joining the Royal Army of Afghanistan. Throughout the 2000s, Prime Minister Massoud guides the nation to stability and peace, he also introduces multiple reforms, albeit at a slow pace, including restoring civil liberties not enjoyed since the 1973 coup, universal suffrage, and improving women's rights, while maintaining a healthy balance between Islamic traditionalism and secularism in Afghan society and politics. The American government, first under President Al Gore and later under his successor, John McCain, ensures that Afghanistan prospers, with American loans helping to rebuild the country and its economy. By 2011, 10 years on after the war, Afghanistan is the most prosperous nation in Central Asia, enjoying a strong military alliance with the United States and beneficial trade relationship with the People's Republic of China. On October 19, 2014, just five days after his 100th birthday, King Mohammad Zahir Shah passes away peacefully in his palace in Kabul, surrounded by his wife and children, as well as his dear friend, Prime Minister Ahmad Shah Massoud. As soon as King Mohammed passes, his son, Crown Prince Ahmad Shah Khan, ascends to the throne. Prime Minister Massoud declares two weeks of mourning, and after the end of the mourning period, King Ahmad is officially crowned as the next king of Afghanistan, ensuring that the royal family will continue to ensure stability for the Afghan people for generations to come. As his first act as king, King Ahmad bestows upon Prime Minister Ahmad Shah Massoud the title of Hero of the Afghan Nation. The rest of the 2010s remains a period of reconstruction and prosperity for Afghanistan. August 15, 2021 is a day like any other in Kabul. Overhead, planes take off from Mohammad Zahir Shah International. From the minarets of Kabul, muezzins recite the Adhan, the Islamic call of prayer. Men and women get to work opening up their shops across the newly paved streets of Kabul. The markets are bustling, filled with grandmothers getting ingredients for that night's dinner. Little girls work on their homework through the next day. As the people of Kabul make their way across the city center, two figures watch over them. In the middle of the city is a mural of two smiling men standing side by side. King Mohammed and Prime Minister Massoud's illustrated counterparts watch over the people of Kabul as the country enters a new era of prosperity. 
the people of Kabul take note of the mural and move on, never knowing how different their lives could have been in another world.